Okay, everyone. Welcome to the third presentation in the virtual noon lecture series of the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies in winter term 2022. I'm Anne Chu Lin, Associate Professor of Public Policy and Director of the China Center. Today's presentation will be held as a discussion with Dr. Osgood discussing the legacy of Zhang Yimou's historic show and the significance of its 2022 sequel. Also, please note before we start that the previously scheduled talk by Sang Surima Ujid will be rescheduled to a later date. Also, let me tell you about the next presentation um, in our lecture series. So Tuesday, February 15th, next week, our lecture will be given by Yu Hua Wang, Frederick S. Danziger Associate Professor in the Department of Government at Harvard University. And he'll be speaking on the rise and fall of imperial China, the social, the social origins of state development. Today's presentation will be given by Miles Osgood, a lecturer at Stanford University whose research focuses on the intersections between international sports, world literature, and the arts. His work on the Olympics has appeared in the Washington Post, N Plus One, Public Books, and an article forthcoming in the journal Modernism Modernity. He is currently writing a book about the Cultural Olympiad of 1968 in Mexico City, provisionally titled the Artist's Torch. Miles wrote a recent article about the 2008 Olympics opening ceremony in Slate last week. Today, Miles will be speaking on Two Spectacles, Two Crowds, a dialogue, a dialogue on Zhang Yimou's Olympic ceremonies, 2008 and 2022. In a departure from our usual format, we'll be holding this as a discussion between Miles, myself, and you. So please feel free to put your questions and comments in the Q&A box at any point. We'll blend your questions into the dialogue all the way through. So feel free to start right now. You don't have to wait till the end. And so now I am delighted to present Miles Osgood. Miles, you have a PhD in English literature and you're writing a book about the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, and in particular, the Cultural Olympiad, which was staged concurrently. Tell us how you became interested in the Olympics and how your studies in literature connect to it. Yeah, thank you very much um, for that question and for that introduction. It's great to be joining the LRCCS um, and to, to meet all of you virtually. Um, so, so my yeah, my field is in English literature, and my subfield, I suppose, is modernism and the avant-garde, the culture of the early 20th century. Um, and the reason that started to intersect with the Olympics um, is because I, I sort of stumbled across a discovery that has not been written about very much, that the Olympics used to award medals to writers and artists uh, as legitimate Olympic competitors from 1912 to 1948. Um, in a series of competitions that the, the founder of the games <laughs> affectionately called the pentathlon of the muses. Um, and this, this drew in a number of significant uh, modernist uh, and avant-garde writers and artists in ways one wouldn't expect um, who were interested in the intersections uh, of sports and the arts. Um, now those artists didn't tend to win the medals because the Olympics were looking for something much more conservative. Um, and I think that actually starts a pattern um, that we can see running all the way through the 21st century in terms of how the arts and the Olympics intersect. Um, but you know, that, that side of it, that early 20th side of it is early 20th century side of it is, is a story for another time. So I'm transitioning, you know, as I started, you know, with this kernel of early 20th century culture and uh, English language literature with a poetry submission, for instance, by Robert Graves in 1924, I realized that this was really, this had to be a global project, a world literature project, a global arts project. Um, and while China didn't figure into that so much in the early 20th century, apart from one or two paintings that were sometimes submitted by way of the UK or other competing nations, um, certainly by the time you get to the era of the Cultural Olympiad, which follows from the art competitions um, starting in the 50s and 60s, and then more, more importantly, the era of the grand spectacle of the opening ceremonies, um, which got bigger and bigger over the course of the, the 80s all the way through the present, 
um, that international and global story has become more and more interesting as it has intersected uh, with international politics. So that's really interesting. So, I mean, in some ways, all of the art that was presented um, as part of the Olympics in the early 20th century has pretty much now been moved to the opening and closing ceremonies. Is that right? Yeah, that's how it seems to me. Um, you know, what was once an open competition um, where, you know, generally maybe you had to submit through a National Olympic Committee, but you could more, but in many cases, you could submit at large. Um, leading to a very diverse set of international artworks that were not always uh, approved of by the host country, for instance, um, has become more and more centralized. Um, so, you know, if you look back to the 1930s, there's, there's quite an interesting set of provocative artworks that show up in official Olympic galleries, whether that's in Los Angeles in 1932, where you have um, Latin American artists uh, and American artists who are creating, you know, uh, sometimes things that border on protest pieces about racial politics um, in the U.S. and in the Americas, all the way through uh, the, the project that I'm focusing on now, Mexico City in 1968, where you have the, the hosts inviting a series of official artists, um, you know, from all over the world, from the U.S., from the Soviet Union, um, from, from neighboring countries, next to Mexico. Um, and then you, but then again, you have, um, you have this history of dissenting artists who also take advantage of the fact that there's an international crowd that's watching to also participate in their own way. So famously in 1968, the poet Octavio Paz is invited to, to write an official cantata or some kind of song to the youth, realizes over the course of 1968 that the youth that he's supposed to address are in open revolt. Um, and does not submit an official Olympic poem, but after, after a terrible ma massacre in Mexico City, submits an unofficial poem and circulates it among the invited poets uh, to the games. Um, there's all these stories like that in the era of the art competitions too. You know, For instance, when Berlin was hosting the infamous Nazi Olympics of 1936, um, there was a concurrent art exhibition in Amsterdam called the Olympics Under Dictatorship that invited a lot of the avant-garde artists who would have been deemed degenerate very soon by the Third Reich um, to participate in an alternative Olympic exhibition. Um, and so, you know, I think this is, this is interesting background for me in terms of what's at stake when artists become, you know, sort of fully commissioned by the state in the era of the, uh, in the era, era of the, where the opening ceremonies become the centerpiece of the cultural Olympiad um, to, you know, either participate in whatever image the, the, the state wants to present or to do something concurrently that's unofficial knowing that there's an international audience for it. So that's really interesting. And I think it reminds us of how political the Olympics have always been. Um, so I'm wondering if you sort of think about 1968 Mexico City um, to 2008 Beijing, um, are there similarities between those events or did your interest in the 2008 opening ceremony develop separately? Yeah, there, there are similarities. I, I think the most prominent of which is that, um, you know, th these are these are moments when a new continent, as it were, or or at least a new kind of broad cultural territory is entering the Olympics as a host and sees that not only as uh, as an opening to be part of global sports in some ways, but to promote a certain cultural presence. So in the 1960s, um, you know, the official government line was that Mexico was celebrating an economic miracle, um, and this was going to be the first, uh, the first Olympics in Latin America. Um, and, you know, and, and, but what they decided to do was not, not solely promote uh, Mexican culture, but really look for, look to make Mexico City uh, appear cosmopolitan, um, or to show off its, its cosmopolitan nature by inviting a lot of foreign artists, um, you know, Duke Ellington, Dave Brubeck, uh, designers from New York, uh, Merce Cunningham, Martha Graham, um, dancers from America, but also, you know, like I was saying before, artists and cosmonauts from the Soviet Union, whether that's Yevgeny Yevtushenko in poetry, um, or, uh, yeah, or, or, or cosmonauts. Um, then uh, and, and and actually in in total I think artists from 97 countries you know so some some prominent ones come from kind of the Cold War powers but also a, a number of lesser known artists who who use the Mexico City Olympics to sort of make themselves more widely known um, and that you know to some extent that international coalition or that inter international project worked it really was a global festival that lasted the whole year, not just during the Olympics, but building all the way from January to October. 
Um, now that participation became fraught in October, you know, not only because of all the events around the world in 1968, but but specifically because of local student protests. Um, and there's a very interesting there's a very interesting development there of Mexico City having having uh, invited a New York designer to create this very 60s op art design all around the city that again made Mexico look very modern um, and cosmopolitan. And students taking advantage of that to make parody posters using those designs where bayonets were thrust through uh, doves or um, grenadiers were marching in front of the Olympic 68 symbol. Um, so there's, there's all this interplay of the official and unofficial arts in these events. Um, so when I, when I look forward to, to Beijing, again, we have a situation here where this was the first, um, this was the first Olympics, not in, not in East Asia, Tokyo had hosted, but in China, um, it was, um, it was again sort of announcing uh, major economic growth in China and what many people seem to think under Hu Jintao was a sort of opening to the world and to, to, global, to global markets over the, over the preceding years. Um, and again, I think there was this aspiration to do something international in the arts in that, with, with that idea in mind. Um, so we can talk about this a little bit more, but, but the idea for the opening ceremonies originally was not just to have a single director in Zhang Yimo, but, but to have along with him a kind of set of artistic collaborators. So there was a foreign firm that was responsible for designing the bird's nest and they enlisted, um, they enlisted the help of Ai Weiwei in terms of coming up with the, with the general concept for it. So there's another Chinese artist, but one who, who would very quickly kind of run afoul of the government. Um, there was Ang Lee, uh, you know, representing, uh, representing Taiwan, but also the United States and Hollywood to some extent in terms of where his career had gone. And then Steven Spielberg was attached to the project for a few years. Um, so again, I think there was this idea that even though there wasn't going to be as wide of a cultural Olympiad, a year long cultural festival as Mexico City had, that that centerpiece, the opening ceremony would itself be an international venture, at least at the start, that was how it was envisioned. I, I just think that's so fascinating. And I think about how different the um, opening ceremonies might have been if it had it incorporated more of those influences. Um, but obviously it was a pretty amazing spectacle even without. Um, you say in your slate piece that the show reached a global audience of 2 billion people, the 2008 opening ceremonies, 2 billion people. That's really astonishing. Um, so I'm wondering if you can maybe just walk us through the opening ceremony a little bit, reminding us of some of the most significant set pieces. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I'm, why don't I share some, some slides here and we can look at some images together as I kind of go through this. Um, yeah, it, it, this is the, the, the sheer scale of this uh, event is one of the things that justifies my entire project of looking at the Olympic arts across the 20th century, right, or, or across the 20th and 21st century. The idea that you could start with these little, these little contests in Stockholm in 1912 and the idea that the Olympics and the arts should come together and then ultimately come up with the biggest show, you know, the world had ever seen, you know, the, the biggest live audience the world had ever had for any event. And that that would be for a for a work of performance art of all things um, is pretty remarkable and, and I think retroactively, like I said, like justifies a lot of the attention one might give in terms of the development of the Olympic arts. So so the 2008 Beijing ceremony has always been in my mind throughout my research, and I'm really glad to be touching on them now and thinking about them now. Um, this was this is sort of the indelible image of the beginning of the opening ceremonies. Um, these uh, drums had been had been a recent archaeological discovery, and they were fitted with LED lights. Uh, and 2008 performers, uh, famously on August 8th, 2008, at eight o'clock, all the lucky number eights um, in a row, um, dr drummed uh, on these faux drums um, to make them light up according to both uh, Arabic numerals um, and Chinese characters to do the to do the official countdown. So that, you know, there's all these rituals in the Olympic ceremonies that have to be done according to the IOC and according to precedent and according to tradition. Um, but but it had never been done on this scale or this creatively or this memorably. Um, and I think this is this is the kind of image that that really divided spectators ultimately between those who saw this as, a, as an incredibly um, impressive celebration uh, of Chinese culture. Um, you know, the, the Chinese coming out party, you know, was the cliche of the year um, versus those who saw this as oppressively militaristic and disciplined. Um, and I think we'll, we'll get into some of the duality of that coverage. 
Um, some other some other images we might look at and, and come back to um, include this giant LED screen um, that was that was uh, at the base of the stadium. Um, Jean uh, conceived of the whole project as being centered around um, the, the one of the great ancient inventions, specifically paper. He ultimately would fold in all the all the four major inventions, but um, originally he thought paper would be the centerpiece, and it and it sort of was. Um, where he had dancers uh, sort of paint, as it were, on this blank canvas, ultimately would raise it up and then and then would draw our attention at the end of the ceremony to a scroll um, at the top of the stadium uh, that was the Olympic cauldron, but again evoked um, the importance of paper in, in China's history and, uh, you know, self-mythologizing. Um, there's this, there's this very um, uh, complex, uh, but also breathtaking moment um, when Zhang switches from, from one invention to another and, and, and does a tribute to uh, printmaking and movable type. Um, these are the, all these blocks um, have individual characters on them, but they also were raised and lowered to represent um, characters as a whole. And it, and it turned out that they were all operated again by by human by human operators by human dancers and performers, um, which was which was a which was a big surprise when all the lids opened and it turned out that this was not technological wizardry, um, but in fact human coordination and and more choreography on the level of about nine hundred performers. Um, other moments we might remember uh, this is this is where that that sheet of paper. Uh, which again is, I think, is a digital screen. Was raised off the ground, um, and we get a tribute to um, uh, Chinese exploration, the Silk Road, the compass. Um, a nice, a nice image here that represents the fact that this this performance did not just only use masses of performers in coordination, um, but juxtaposed that often with individual talents, um, sometimes pop celebrities, um, pianists, singers, dancers. Um, and um, in any case, um, there, there, what we sometimes forget in our images of this is that yes, there were there were massive coordinated um, choreographic performances, but there were also um, you know remarkable individual acts, and that that again speaks to sort of the complexity and duality of the show in terms of what Zhang was asked to do and what he conceived of doing. Um, and you know, then then the last thing we might look at here is just you know the significance of the bird's nest itself. It was built not really for sports purposes, but for the sake of these ceremonies. Um, if anything, it's a soccer stadium, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as significant of it as an Olympic structure uh, for for Olympic events so much as it was for the ceremonies. Um, obviously, you know, fireworks. There, there we get the completion of the of the four of the four inventions, and so far as gunpowder is also celebrated. Um, I, I mention, I'll mention again that you know Ai Weiwei was involved in coming up with the concept for this stadium, um, but but ultimately by the time the Olympic ceremonies uh, arrived, he had really um, turned against the games. He was um, he was especially concerned with the um, the earthquake that had that had occurred earlier that year and the way he felt uh, that victims of that earthquake were being neglected or or that their names and numbers had, were being swept under the rug by the by the government. And so he had become an, an outspoken critic of, of the games, um, of Chinese government policies, of Zhang Yimou's show specifically, and, and its, its propagandistic nature uh, as he saw it. Um, so, you know, already we see a schism in the original artistic collaboration there. Uh, but anyway, I just thought I would, I would end with this image as, uh, as a sort of representation of what, what this all looked like from the outside. Well, that's really great because I think that also takes us, you know, directly into um, your 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 really great slate um, article um, and the sort of thing that we want to explore, which is, as you had mentioned um, just a bit ago, um, the duality of meanings that Zhang Yimou is trying to convey here. So let me just read one sentence from your slate piece. Um, you said, facing national expectations and international crowds. Zhang Yimou's show needed to take on separate meanings for internal and external audiences. So give us an example of that duality. 
Yeah, thanks. That's, um, yeah, I think that's a really important aspect of this show. Um, and sometimes it was picked up upon by, by TV commentators who, you know, had, had scripts to sort of guide them through some of the cultural references. You know, I think this is a really key, this is a really key moment to me. And I think a moment that a lot of viewers of the show remember, um, the, the, the blocks were organized in three different scripts um, to repeat the character hey, what I mean, I'm apologize for my pronunciation, um, which is you know a prefix for a number of, of significant words, but but most importantly associated, as I understand it, with the term harmony. And you can see, you know, on either end of the blocks, this is accompanied by again, I think something on the order of probably two thousand performers. It was always it was almost always two thousand and eight performers um, who who read out in unison um, some of the uh, some passages from Confucius's Analects. Um, including the very first Analect, isn't it, you know, that line from the middle of the first Analect, um, isn't it lovely to have friends coming from afar? So the character harmony to an international crowd in terms of how it was broadcast by international commentators, you know, seemed to suggest this, this idea of, um, of international harmony, of China opening itself up to the world, and to wanting to get along with its neighbors um, and its partners. Uh, but to um, to national viewers, to local viewers, you know, the, the term harmony specifically evoked uh, a party policy, the Hu Jintao motto of, of harmonious society, um, which, you know, probably was meant unironically by Zhang to kind of celebrate that motto or to or to promote that motto on the government's behalf. Um, but for a, for a number of local critics of the show would have also sort of, you know, sounded alarm bells insofar as the Harmonious Society tagline had become kind of a, not exactly a joke, but a, um, a, 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 a lightning rod for criticism around censorship specifically. Um, then on top of that, you have the moment when these blocks open up and, 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 you know, people come out, you know, waving and smiling. That was the kind of moment that Ai Weiwei would criticize saying, you know, look at these fake smiles that were rehearsed Look at how you know these these carefully disciplined performers are trying to seem happy and and so forth. So that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it was how a lot of the coverage was um, in the West, in the UK, and and the United States, which fixated on the idea of you know what must this choreographed discipline have been like? Um, you know how is this representative of a military mobilization in China in the in the preceding years? Um, but then on top of that, you know, to me the argument seemed much less militaristic, if, if, if anything, and, and much more economic, that here was this machinery that seemed to be a technological marvel and had a kind of industrial quality to it of these, of these kind of nesting boxes that like pistons were moving up and down. And then ultimately, you know, if, if that's how you look at it, the economic engine that underlies it, you know, is this, this massive, you know, labor force, which is both, both potentially a celebration and also an advertisement, you know, for China at that time. Um, so I, I just think of this as a very complex and layered moment that meant different things to different commentators and is still potentially being unpacked um, as people look back on 2008. Yeah, one of the things I thought was extremely interesting about your piece is that you say, you know, that in hindsight, you know, people from the West look back on those ceremonies and they say, oh, well, China was signaling that it's going to be an author authoritarian country, right? This is the triumph, triumph of authoritarianism. But the the story was really i think more mixed at the moment yeah that's true i think it was mixed you know it was mixed in both um in both western and and chinese circles where you see the same kind of crit criticisms that the west was making among certain chinese film critics who are worried that this is of a piece with Zhang's kind of turn to celebrating um you know great armies and impressive authoritarian powers in his kind of in his older films representing the Chinese empire, uh, you know, he had made this turn in recent years, and we can talk more about this in a moment, to, to a specific form of the wuxia genre, where he specifically kind of made multiple movies like Hero and Curse of the Golden Flower, that were stories of failed rebellions of, you know, individuals trying to take down massive empires and, and the just awe-inspiring power of those armies being um, impregnable. Um, and, Anyway, so that's so that's one way of looking at that. On, on the flip side, you know, in the West, as much as there was certain criticism from, you know, people like Roger Ebert, who in the same breath was also praising the show as being utterly spectacular. Uh, you know, we, you think about Steven Spielberg, who dropped out of advising on these opening ceremonies because he got pressure um, 
from, from colleagues uh, over China's involvement in Sudan and, and potentially, you know, indirectly or directly funding the genocide in Darfur, um, who nevertheless then nominated Zhang Yimou for time person of the year and, you know, remarked that this was an incredible ceremony and who really, and, and Spielberg really bought into this idea that it was, it was all about international harmony. Um, it was all about the kinds of values that the Olympics uh, espouse publicly. So, um, you know, was, was perfectly willing to, to take a sort of idealistic and optimistic view of what these ceremonies represented. So again, it's not, it's, it's not just that it's a, it's a complex uh, reading of sort of Western critics versus Chinese proponents. There's, there was dialogue and dissent um, in, both, uh, in both networks, as far as I can tell. Thank you. I think that's really, I think that's really important to, to hear. And I think, you know, um, <clears throat> helps, helps us avoid some of the problems of, you know, looking at 2008 with our glasses of 2022. Right. We've got a question um, from one of our attendees um, about Zhang Yimou's role. And so this person writes, um, I was introduced to Zhang Yimou as a filmmaker back when he made the films Red Sorghum, Judo and raise the Red Lantern. At that time, I understood him to be an outlaw to the government and in fact thought he had trouble showing his films at home. Then he started making the martial arts spectaculars like House of the Flying Daggers. So how did he go from being this outsider to the producer of the Chinese Olympic ceremony? Yeah, that's a that's a great question and something I've been learning more about as I as I do research on this project and on these ceremonies. I think that it's complicated, right? I, I think that's I think that's broadly correct, and that's the same view that I take is that there's there's sort of at two or three phases to Zhang's career. A first phase from his first film, 1987, Red Sorghum, all the way through around 1999, where he's he's he tends to do these kind of small. Um, historically uh, based um, films about, about um, specific moments, whether that's um, sort of early 20th century feudal or imperial China to kind of mid-century um, cultural revolution, you know, things that, things that impacted him and his family or, and his, uh, his ancestry. Zhang, you know, it famously was the son of a of a Kuomintang officer and and had a hard life as a as a kid and and did not have an easy time kind of making the transition from being uh, a rural laborer to a filmmaker um, and had a pretty skeptical view it seemed of of the Communist Party and of Chinese communist history and a lot of his films his early films were censored in China even though they were doing really well or maybe because they were doing really well at foreign film festivals and then. And, and again, you know, there's some nuance here, right? There, there are ways of reading films like Red Sorghum as, you know, ultimately patriotic and, and in line with certain communist principles and that kind of thing. But the, yeah, so, so one hinge point in his career seems to be around 1994 to 1999, where he creates the film To Live, um, and he gives a false script to the Chinese censors for what he plans to do with this literary material. Um, that, you know, false script that paints a more positive image of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, and then ultimately creates this film that's that's pretty critical and pretty tragic. Um, it has an optimistic ending in a way, or sort of sentimental ending, um, but on the whole does not paint a pretty picture of, of, the, of the, the communist revolution and, the after, and its aftermath. Um, now, it, it may just be, you know, the way it looks is, is at that point, he just sort of got tired of fighting the state, um, where he, he was prohibited from receiving foreign funds for future films for five years after his deception was found out. Um, and he comes out of that uh, in 1999, in the early 2000s, making films that, that, are, that are more benign politically, or even kind of more in line with, with um, contemporary ide ideology politically, and then makes the switch to, to doing big blockbuster wuxia films, which are, which, are supported by, which are supported by the government and promoted abroad for, for the kinds of foreign prizes that once made Zhang suspicious. Then I think you know the other hinge point in his career is the 2008 opening ceremonies, um, where he you know starts to work on these international collaborations with other filmmakers and starts to realize you know starts to realize that he might have something like a, a not just an international film festival audience but a but a broad international audience and can maybe be part of this new movement in Chinese film to try to cross over to Hollywood, and starts making these movies like The Great Wall. 
um, and uh, Flowers of War starring, starring, you know, Hollywood actors like Matt Damon and Christian Bale, um, thinking that, you know, maybe he can make these crossover hits. And those movies do pretty well in China, but they're, they, they don't do that. They don't do that great, uh, you know, in the United States and in the world. Um, he's kind of struggled to, to really succeed with that, with that goal of a crossover. But certainly in the, in the span of, of 1999 to the present, um, he's done more and more films that just have huge budgets and huge sets and huge spectacle on either end of the 2008 opening ceremonies. And you can see him either rehearsing or continuing to practice um, the kinds of things that made the 2008 ceremony so memorable. Yeah. So here's a really interesting question from Maura Cunningham, who's one of our attendees. Um, and she says, I'm interested in hearing your comments on reading the opening ceremonies through a gendered lens. It seems like you could view 2008 as coded masculine, especially with that enduring image of the drum corps, mm. um, while the snowflakes and the softer music of 2022 read as more feminine. Do you see other examples and how would you analyze this from an artistic viewpoint? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's a really good point. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of it specifically in that way. I mean, I think the obvious, the, the sort of obvious um, transition from 2008 to 2022, which I think everybody is thinking about is more about nationalism and internationalism, right? But I, I think you're, I think you're right that um, such a large body of the performers and the most memorable performances of 2008 are men and, you know, specifically men, you know, um, also, you know, singing or speaking in unison and loud voices, um, you know, whether it's certain characters or, you know, like I was saying, the Analects or something like that. Um, so there is this kind of memorable sound of the male voice, in spite of the fact that, you know, at the same time, you get a duet that's male, female in the 2008 ceremonies. You get um, this infamous moment where uh, a young girl um, sings a patriotic song or rather lip syncs it as it turned out to be the case, <laughs> turned out to be the case. Um, but I, I think you're right that that um, in addition to 2022 being obviously and overtly more international, um, less uh, sort of a self celebration, um, insofar as there are key moments where there's you know a choir of girl singers hanging out under the snowflake, um, and um, I'm trying to think of yeah I'm trying to think of other kind of corroborating details here. Um, maybe just generally, you know, a, a sort of softer image of China, um, you know, the, the coming together of the national snowflakes and the kind of final meta image of the, of the snowflake, which I, I can put up here. Um, th those having been born aloft by um, female volunteers, I think, predominantly um, in the parade of nations. Um, yeah, certainly suggests um, a, a greater, a greater presence of female volunteers, female athletes, female performers, um, in addition to that, that sort of more general sense of, uh, you know, masculine militaristic uh, vigor and power versus, um, yeah, versus something that might be more coded feminine. I, I think I think there's a lot to that. Yeah, uh, that one of the things that when I, you know, thought about when I think about the two opening ceremonies, one thing that really strikes me is the use of color. You know, mm. how much red was a symbol and a theme in the 2008 um, opening ceremony and then sort of the use of blue and white, you know, and other obviously other colors, too. I think that opening set is a very green, you, um, you lots of green light sticks, but especially towards the end, the sort of really the really overwhelming use of blue and white. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that use of color. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think with Zhang, it's so tricky because he's seen as, you know, I think that's one of his nicknames is the master of color. And he's seen as somebody who's very intentional and deliberate with color, but not always in a way that's obvious where, you know, color necessarily symbolizes a certain value every time in every film or even consistently within the same film. You know, if you think about, um, you know, a film like Raise the Red Lantern, for instance, you know, red or, or um, you know, in films that go through later Chinese history where red is similarly very important, but, you know, sometimes signifies politics, sometimes signifies passion, um, you know, can have these different meanings. And so when I think about the difference between red and blue, you know, I think it's tempting to kind of go to, 
basic symbolism of, again, sort of nationalism versus internationalism, the, the red of China and the blue of something like the United Nations, um, or, or, you know, militarism and pacifism or something like that. But I think what's more important is just the idea that Zhang, knowing that he wants to tell a different story with different priorities, just decides that that needs a different color palette, that it's more the difference between the colors that's significant rather than what the colors might individually represent. You know, I think of that, I think about that in relation to his blockbuster film Hero, where the different stories told, you know, about this, about this plot against um, the emperor are told, are coded according to different colors. And I don't think it's that the colors, you know, culturally necessarily associate to particular meanings or, or symbolic uh, correspondences. It's, it's just the fact that they're different and that those are supposed to cue you into the fact that we are in different narrative worlds and have different storytellers um, behind these different sections. So I sort of think of the difference that way, where it's it's signifying ultimately that this is a different show, which is the, which is the kind of phrase that Zhang used a lot um, when he was interviewing about the 2022 opening ceremonies, just trying to make sure everybody was clear on the fact that this was a very different approach. So I, I, I think one way to really get into that is just to look at the slides that you have of the 2022 ceremonies. And so maybe you can tell us what you've um, put together for us here. Yeah, so, so you mentioned this moment. This was, this was um, uh, uh, an opening moment right after the countdown again um, for the 2022 ceremonies where you get not quite 2000 performers, more like 400 performers, um, still you know, performing a very beautiful and impressive and coordinated uh, choreography. Um, that's supposed to represent, you know, the, the fact that the Olympics in this case coincided not with 8808, but with the beginning of spring um, in the lunar calendar. And you, you see Zhang wanting to have a sense of scale again, but this time using, you know, leaning into the technology more fully. So I think the, I think the LED screen that was on the, the base of the stadium is perhaps, again, breaking records, I think, like maybe the largest ever. And in any case, it magnifies the work of the 400 performers by, by kind of creating a broader rippling projection. Um, but, but, you know, it, it's, it, this, is, this is the moment that started things off. And along with the cinematic video countdown that preceded it, um, it's, it's again, it's, it's more benign insofar as it's focused more on the natural world um, than on political history. And that marked a lot of the show. You know, when we think about the snowflakes um, it's not just it's not just for you know attractiveness and the idea of of nations that are both unique and that can come together uniformly, um, but also also I just think a, a celebration of the fact that the winter in the Winter Olympics you're much more aware of the presence of uh, of nature as difficult as it is and that Zhang kind of leaned into that as something that was you know safer I think we could say but also also you know nevertheless um, beautiful and compelling. Here's another moment. Um, where we see that, um, where uh, an ink drop becomes a waterfall that fills uh, that fills this entire screen, just so you can get a sense of the size of it. Um, and then, and then I think the moment that everybody will will ultimately talk about with this ceremony, and it should be said that this ceremony was much less widely watched than the one in two thousand eight. Um, particularly in the United States, it was the lowest. Uh, it was the lowest TV turnout at the NBC, NBC has ever had um, for an opening ceremony. And some of that probably does have to do with the fact that some viewers are consciously boycotting it. You know, some of it has to do with the fact that it's the Winter Olympics, um, which are always less appealing that we just had an Olympics uh, six months ago or eight months ago because of, you know, because of COVID delays. Um, who knows? It could be a number of factors. Um, but, you know, Zhang himself wanted this to be much smaller and more modest in addition to being more international. And this snowflake is very much a part of that. The one thing he kept trying to uh, advertise as part of these opening ceremonies, you know, he, he was trying to manage expectations, you could tell in terms of how different this was going to be, how internationalist this was going to be, um, how this was not going to be like 2008 at all. But the one thing he said is we're doing something unprecedented with the Olympic cauldron, and everybody wondered what that meant. And ostensibly what he meant was the fact that there was no cauldron at all, really. Um, there was just a torch uh, that, that, that when the torch arrived at the cauldron, it was planted in, this, in the center of the snowflake rather than lighting something bigger on fire as is normally done. Um, and ostensibly, that's all, that's all Zhang meant. Um, but of course, you know, the, the other really shocking part of it, which you know, one doesn't know whether this was his decision or a decision that went up all the way to Xi Jinping, as seems likely, um, is, to have this, this, is to have two athletes together um, put the torch in the middle of the of the snowflake, and for one of them to be uh, a Uyghur, uh, you know, from Xinjiang. 
Um, and you know, and that that becomes the provocative moment that ends the ceremony that that sort of distracts from everything else. No, I I think that's really right. Let just just to say about the snowflake and the torch, I mean, I couldn't help thinking maybe the torch is melting the snowflakes. It just, <laughs> it was, it was, there was just a little, there was a complicated message there. But I mean, I think we should talk about this a little bit. So as I'm sure the um, people attending the Zoom know, um, the final torch lighters were a pair of um, athletes born in the 2000s. Um, the, the male biathlete is um, Zhao Jiwen, um, he, and he is, um, has a Han ethnicity. Um, and then the woman is, um, is Dini Jier um, Ila Mujang, who, who is a female cross-country skier of Uyghur ethnicity. Um, and so I was watching the NBC broadcast, and they had Andy Brown, who um, was formerly the head of the Wall Street Journal's China Bureau, um, and he said, this is an in your face move to show that China will not be criticized. He says, China will not be criticized by the West. Um, is that how you saw it? Yeah, and, and to some extent, but you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't think of it as, as you know, looking back on the whole show, I thought that was kind of in accordance with what the, what the whole ceremony was doing. So I agree, but I also don't know that, it, that at the end, it should have been as shocking as it was insofar as I think Zhang himself had the same mission, not, not so much to, to create in your face moments. I think as you know, I was saying, there's a lot about the show that's fairly safe and benign, but also not to shy away from the kind of criticism that he had received. And I think, I think that's, where, that's where the preceding show that Zhang devised and this final moment um, have something in common. So I think about the fact, for instance, you know, that that some of the things that um, that Zhang and the and the Chinese Communist Party and and the Beijing organizers got criticized for in two thousand eight um, include the fact that um, you know the representative the children who represented the fifty six ethnicities um, in uh, in two thousand oh I, this should say two thousand eight on the left um, some of them were not actually from those regions and were just dressed up representing certain regions and that you know that alarmed a lot of people considering what that meant for China really trying authentically to include Tibet and other regions as part of its national character. Um, you know, that, 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 that idea, that image was repeated by Zhang rather than shying away from, from something that had been deliberately criticized in 2008 and had been a, a source of scandal, you know, sort of repeat, returned to that motif in 2022 with adults who again were sort of dressed up in these different um, ethnic, costumes. And then, you know, similarly, they hand off the flag in 2008 to uh, a number of, of soldiers in the People's Liberation Army who then goose stepped to the, to the flagpole. And that was another moment where in the West, this seemed uh, unnecessarily militaristic. This was not a common or established feature of opening ceremonies to have soldiers on stage who would do the official flag raising. Um, and yet again, you know, whether this directive comes from on high or as a choice by the filmmaker, we, you know, that he makes the same choice, or rather the show makes the same choice in 2022, not wanting to um, bow under the pressure of that prior criticism. So, you know, I, I think in that, in that respect, when I look at this image, I think, you know, the point is, is not necessarily to, um, to intimidate the people in Xinjiang or to, or to try to uh, come up with a provocative image for you know NBC viewers or American viewers or something like that necessarily. I mean, that's possible. That's that's certainly one of the ripple effects of this decision. Um, but rather not to try to shy away from criticism, right? To 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 just to to acknowledge it and to address it head on and to try to represent this, you know, this moment as as you might expect, as as China saying, not um not in uh, not sort of here's rebuttal, but rather nothing is wrong. And that itself, you know, that itself may well be concerning to a lot of us, right? I think we, we look at other previous Olympics that have been, um, you know, that have been the subject of boycotts or that have been politically fraught um, going back at least as far as the Berlin games in the 1930s. And, and you know, together the Germans and Lenny Riefenstahl did go about a similar tactic. I mean, people think of that that Lenny Riefenstahl film Olympia as being very sort of pro-Aryan and um, 
and trying to represent, you know, sort of German ideology. And that's true for the first few minutes of that film. Um, but ultimately, what it tries to do is actually make German nationalism seem not particularly exceptional to make it look as though it's a nationalism among many forms of patriotism and nationalism that all the participating countries you know, join in on. And I think that's what's notable about, about this moment to me um, of, these, of these two torchbearers is yes, here they are in, in a same uniform trying to you know, sort of level out any regional differences or conflicts that might be occurring in China at this time. Um, but it's like, well, we've just had the parade of nations and here are all these, all, all these other countries in their own uniforms where differences in, in race or political conflicts internal to those countries are somewhat elided. Under the under the national banner, and so in a way, you know, this this image of of sort of again to use that term like benign internationalism can itself be an argument and a weapon, um, and 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 to see all the the names of these countries that were brought out um, by the volunteers in front of the parade of nations and have those surround this moment of okay, two you know. Uh, a Han, a Han Chinese person, and a and a, Jin, and, a, and, a and an athlete from Xinjiang. Um, yeah, it, it strikes me as as a similar kind of gesture of of you know using using internationalism kind of combatively. Yeah, I I mean I, that's a really good point, and I think back to you know what you what you wrote about the two thousand and eight Olympics that you really have to see that this has a national audience and an international audience at the same time, and you know if what what China's done around. Um, you know, accusate around accusations of genocide in Xinjiang is to come back and to say, you know, oh no, these are, you know, these are vocational training opportunities. And, you mm -hmm. know, oh, this is, you know, we're we're sending soldiers in to stay with families, but this is really about friendship and creating, you know, these connections. And I think if you're a if you're somebody in China who you know isn't paying that much attention to the news and maybe vaguely has a sense that the West is trying to cause trouble for China again by you know accusing it of racism, right. you see this picture and I think you see it as inclusivity. I mean, right. I think they see it as you know yes, this is you know reminding us that we are a country you know of all of these nationalities, and. I also think it's sort of interesting to think about this from the Western point of view, because if the one of the examples I think we talked briefly about is Kathy Freeman, but you know if this were, you know, a a, a picture in the West with multiple ethnicities, you know, holding a torch together, I think you know, the commentators would assume no, this is about inclusivity, you know as opposed to, you know, this is about um, criticism. And I, you know, so I, you know, I, I guess I just think it's in, important to see that the message that the West, you know, Western commentators are taking from this is only one of the messages that this is sending. Right. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, I um, think that makes sense. No, go ahead. Oh, I, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, the, the, the thing that complicates that is insofar as the messaging from the government has been, you know, the criticisms, you know, the, the, the sentencing of, this, of these acts as genocide and so forth, these are all like the one big lie or the lie of the century or something like that. It seems, uh, you know, given that that's been the line, the party line, uh, risk, risky in a way to draw, to draw more attention to it. You know, both for your both for your national audience and for an international audience. So, in the, you know, in that respect, you know, it feels like the necessity of responding rather than simply, you know, one one could also imagine, you know, well, why is it specifically these two ethnicities finally holding the torch at the end? Um, you know, it it's not, you know, it, one could have done other things in terms of um, in terms of representing inclusivity, right? You know, do you do you address do you do you try to welcome an athlete from from Hong Kong, in spite of the fact that they compete under a different banner for now, you know, something like that. Um, so the, the choice, you know, obviously still significant and inevitably provocative. Um, but yeah, I, I, I take your point. I think I think that's right, that, that it, it probably reads differently nationally. So we have some really fantastic um, comments and questions from the audience. And I just want to read a couple of them and, you know, sort of see maybe which you feel um, you know, that you kept, you most want to respond to. 
Um, so David Ralston says that another aspect of Zhang Yimou's career was his direction of outdoor spectacles at Chinese tourist sites. Um, how does that dovetail with his Olympic spectacle? Um, Fang Fei Miao says um, that there are also two vice directors, um, Zhang Jigang and Chen Weiya, who are all dance choreographers that also made a lot of these um, artistic decisions. Um, and so, you know, to sort of think about, and she also raises this very interesting point. She says, um, how do we theorize Zhang Yimou without falling back to a Western centered lens um, that often approaches China's performance through individualism or individualism versus collectivism, I imagine, right? right. Um, and then the Emily Wilcox um, has a question um, for us where she's talking more about the coverage and she says, you know, that she watched the um, prime time version and was quite disappointed that almost the entire time was spent on the march of athletes um, mm -hmm. rather than on the performance. Um, and I think we talked briefly about how the performance this year was really cut up, you know, it wasn't just, you know, didn't occur in one large piece. Um, and she says two other things that she, you know, both was it was great to see an actual China specialist, um, Yale's Jing Tzu, um, among the commentators, um, and also the fact that the American um, broadcast really commented on Putin quite often, and you know almost as if he was as much a focus um, as China. Um, and let's see. So yeah, I've I've just thrown a whole bunch of things at you. I don't know if you want to pick up any of them. Yeah, these are all great questions. You know, and and I think I you know. I, as is probably apparent from my introduction, you know, I'm I'm less of a specialist on um, specific questions of uh, of Chinese culture and history than I am on you know sort of world literature and its intersections with the Olympics. So I you know I'm very appreciative of these questions also as generating new thoughts in this community and also for me in terms of questions I should be asking and things I should be thinking about. So I just wanted to say that at the outset. So there's sort of two categories of things to think about here, it sounds like. One of which is, um, what do we make of this in relation to Zhang's other work and his collaborators? And then what do, we, what do we think ultimately about the reception of 2022 and the broadcasting of it in the United States? So on the first front, um, yeah, I, I think it's certainly it's certainly oversimplifying to say that um, that the 2008 show was really Zhang's show only any more than the 2022 show was. It was certainly presented that way. I, I was really, you know, this actually intersects with the with the broadcasting question. I was really uh, taken when I when I rewatched the 2008 ceremonies at how often his name came up. Um, you know, but in Bob Costas's mouth back in 2008, I, you know, I, I think there usually you don't get quite that level of attention to a director. I think everybody recognized that he was that he is such a significant director for China, the most well known internationally. Um, and the fact that the fact that there was this sort of very public falling out with his collaborators or or disappearance of the collaborators made it seem more and more like a one man show. But certainly that's yeah, that's certainly not the case there. Are, um, choreographers in terms of music and dance who had a significant role and who also had a significant international presence, you know, who were who were doing shows uh, around the world also in 2008 and had their own, you know, would have been, um, would have had just, could have had justified coverage of their own names and their own work. Um, and I, yeah, I'll just say that I think more research is needed there on my behalf and be interesting to continue to carry out that conversation. Um, in terms of Zhang's work um, with things like um, things like opera that that immediately preceded um, the the Olympics. You know, there was there were some funny interviews that came out around then that 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 might strike folks as interesting um, about him talking about how difficult it was to coordinate actors in other media um, and in other forms of public presentations. Um, whether that was for, I think he did one for one of the like the G20 summit or something like that. Um, and, and like I said, he did he did a, an open air opera performance, I think, at one point. Um, and and, you know, the kinds of commentary that came out between those moments and the 2008 ceremony were what I took to be jokes of Zhang's that he was. Well, I think the real gripes that he was frustrated, how difficult it was to work um, with actors who had very particular labor laws kind of um, controlling their time, as opposed to the kind of control he was able to exert over performers for the 2008 ceremonies. 
and in like I said, like these these comments that seemed tongue in cheek, although I'm not 100% sure about you know how he ultimately was pleased with the, the level of control he was able to exert over performers in 2008 that he said was second only to North Korea, um, which again, you know, to an international readership seems incredibly provocative and maybe tone deaf, um, but, but, you know, it strikes me, you know, it strikes me as only, you know, as, as, uh, as though it must have been um, as though there must have been some kind of uh, ironic tone to it that was lost in translation. But, you know, I, I would be curious if anybody's actually seen those interviews to, to comment on that. So finally, the NBC question. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I agree. I think, you know, um, the, there, was a, there was a prelude to these opening ceremonies that was completely cut from the NBC coverage in favor of the usual profiles of American athletes um, and that's always a disappointment with the way um, that the Olympics are covered throughout the two weeks of the games that we get all these little sort of bio documentaries on individual American athletes and that those are quite nice. Um, but certainly for these being the international games, there's a sort of um, narrow focus um, on what we decide to cover in, you know, compared to sports that could be very interesting, but where the Americans are not as prominent. Um, and, and on athletes, you know, that are not, that are not American. So I, I think the, the fact that the, the opening ceremonies devoted so much attention to the parade of nations to, you know, political issues that seem to affect us more like, like Vladimir Putin's attendance and what was going to happen in Ukraine, um, versus getting into more of the nuances of thinking about China in this moment was, was certainly a little bit disappointing that some of the, some of the early artistic section that pre that preceded the, the, um, the countdown was let out, was left out. That was disappointing. Um, so that, yeah, that's a that's a constant source of frustration with with you know NBC's stranglehold on on American coverage of the Olympics. Um, but I don't know that I have much more to to add on top of that. Yeah, the countdown was really interesting because it basically went through all of these, you know, uh, basically went through all of these different important feasts or you know divisions on the Chinese lunar calendar. And I, and, you know, at, and it brought in, you know, snippets of poetry, you know, quotes from different lines of poetry and everything. And I, as I was watching that, I really wondered how, you know, re resonant is that going to be for Chinese as, you know, as well as the West and not clearly as resonant for the West, but even in China, I thought it was just a very interesting choice to, to go back to, you know, something which is really so um, cultural and cultural in ways that the, the Chinese government has not always been supportive of. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are, so I, you know, there, there again, there's some really lovely questions in the Q and A and some great observations. I guess maybe the way I'll just end this is um, Emily Wilcox and Carol Stepanchuk both have asked about, you know, sort of other kinds of international art spectacles. And so Emily um, says that she's written about the Soviet sponsored World Youth Festivals. Um, from 1949 to 1962. And Carol wonders whether the sort of global stage for avant-garde art is now in the international um, biennial. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that, the sort of, you know, let's think about this again in where you started in the context of an international stage for yeah. art. I, that's that. Those are great questions uh, and great observations. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's I think it's very important to recognize uh, that none of these ceremonies and this is this has been in the nature of what, everything we've talked about. None of these ceremonies appear in a vacuum um, historically or or in their in their present moment. I, I like to think of the opening ceremonies as at this point their own fully fledged medium or genre in the arts. And, and not to say that, the, that it, it may be even a subgenre within that, that greater category of, of international arts festivals um, and, and arts spectacles. 
And in that respect, I think what's important about it is they are constantly responding to the expectations that have been created before, right? Specifically in the, in the, in the case of the Olympic opening ceremonies, there's so much you have to do according to the traditions and the rituals that are, that are set out in the IOC charter. So you have to make a decision, for instance, looking at this image again, about what you're going to do about the, the Olympic cauldron. And, if, and in a sense, like this is breaking the rules. Right? They're, not, they're not lighting a cauldron, they're just leaving the solitary torch in the middle of it as a kind of minimalist, you know, internationalist gesture, um, as, we've, as we've discussed uh, already. And, and yeah, so, so in that respect, you know, one thing that I write about in the slate piece, and, in this, and on this I'm really indebted to, um, to some of my research, which I'll leave up here at the end, some of the readings that I've done um, of other scholars who have thought about these ceremonies, um, is the fact that uh, I don't know whether China participated um, in in the Soviet um, events that you're discussing, but certainly, you know, when you think about Moscow 1980 versus the Spartakiads, the sort of anti-Olympics that the Soviets used to run, and how they sort of folded in, you know, tried to fold together the two traditions um, of workers' Olympics on the one hand, and then and then the IOC Olympics. Um, and, and then you think on the other hand about the fact that um, China used to host national games in the early decades um, uh, after the, uh, you know, after the, the rise of the CCP um, and then decided to, to enter the Olympic movement and become, you know, a, a member state of the IOC um, that you, yeah, you, you have to combine on the one hand, the expectations of what you've set up in your previous festivals um, with which often involve, you know, in in communist states, you know, the representation of the pe of the people by way of mass calisthenics or something like that, um, you know, which represents sort of more um, the coordination of ordinary people and the strength of the strength of the population or something like that, as opposed to some as opposed to to what you know other Olympic ceremonies have done, and then you fold that together with the with with you know, something like Los Angeles 1984, which were the first games that Chinese dignitaries attended in the era of the CCP. And then they, they were seeing this sort of, you know, classical plus pop celebration of American music with this very garish 1980s, uh, you know, fashion and, and graphic design everywhere that looked nothing like, you know, I'm sure what the, what the national games in China would have been up to that point. And so, so I think, you know, as, as these commentators, as the critics have noted, that started a long enduring public debate um, in China about, you know, what, do we try to go in for this sort of corporate, fashionable, uh, trendy, you know, uh, global sports phenomenon, or do we stick to um, the traditions that we've developed in our own stadiums over these years? And I think that's another, that's another layered feature of Zhang's show that, that as a result of that decades long debate, he sort of tried to do both and was probably asked to do both. Um, that on the one hand, he was doing things that would have been more recognizable to an audience that would have gone to stadium ceremonies in the sixties, say, or the seventies. Um, but that also would have seen, you know, utterly spectacular and in keeping with, you know, what the, what the IOC expected and what Olympic audiences would expect. Um, so yeah, I think those, those histories certainly come together. And I think, mo you know, most importantly, all these directors are always looking over their shoulder at, you know, what has been done before in this genre and what can I do with it that both respects the, the parameters of the medium while doing something new. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that's a great way, I think, to end, the, end this discussion. And we've gone a little bit over, but let me just say again, thank you to Miles Osgood. Um, his piece in Slate on last Friday was called What Everyone Got Wrong About the Last Beijing Olympics Opening Ceremony. Um, please go and take a look at it. Um, and then for our regular audience, also remember that our next presentation is next Tuesday, February 15th by Yu Hua Wang um, from Harvard. Thank you very much. Thanks to the audience, um, especially those who stayed over a little bit. Um, and thanks again, Miles, for you know sharing your research with us today. Uh, thanks so much, Anne, and thanks to all of you for your questions. These are really thought-provoking and helpful. And um, yeah, thanks. Just thanks for attending. Um, I think if um, Miles, you and I turn off our cameras but remain here, we're able to do a little debrief afterwards. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody. See you next week.